I can't begin to tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be with you tonight. This is just an amazing thing. As we feel like the United Methodist Church, often we are told these terrible stories about how the denomination is dying, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you just give me so much hope. And I just want to say thank you for having me. All right, are you ready? We're going to pray our way into we're going to pray our way into the scripture reading tonight using a, an invocation to the Holy Spirit from the Iona community in Scotland. And I uh, invite you to stand as you are able, either in mind or in spirit or in body as we sing. And this is very, very simple. Basically, I'll sing to those words. I'll sing something, and then you sing it right back to me. And as I do this, you keep the hands out, you keep going. So I'm a little intimidated because the lid is. Yeah. 
better way to say that, folks who had been marginalized by systems in society. And it was an incredible thing. They served over 50,000 meals a year to anybody who was hungry. They had medical, vision, dental, health clinics in the church itself. They had uh, job assistance, IV recovery. In fact, when Katrina blew through, we had over 25,000 displaced people from the Gulf living in San Antonio. And the city and FEMA gave the church the contract for IV recovery. Because you can't like, get a job, you can't get a loan without IV. It was an amazing place. And the worshiping community, oh, it was like a slice of the kingdom of heaven every Sunday. People of all ages, all races, all sexes, all educational and economic statuses, people of all different sexual orientations, and people of different political stripes all worship together on Sunday and work together. It was one of those things where you'd see someone, a homeless person, worshiping next to the state center. Incredible, incredible. A community that was vibrant and wonderful and a gift, and also at times a real challenge. It's easy to step into divisions when you have that many different people. But wonderful. And so my first, first year that I was finishing up my ordination things for the United Methodist Church, I had everything finished with the exception of one sermon left to go, we videotaped and turned in. And as an associate preacher, you don't get like the prime preaching spots, right? Because <laughs> these are totally off the table. So I got that the Sunday after Thanksgiving, the last Sunday in November, and of course everything was due like that Wednesday, you know, December 1st. So I had one chance to nail the sermon. So I get started preaching, it is going tremendously well. You can see that look. It's going tremendously well. I'll stop spot my heart for still. Um, going tremendously well. Preaching about the prologue to the Gospel of John. Just this beautiful, poetic language. And uh, I, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I mean, we're connected. I'm feeling this is going so well, this sermon. And I, I will never forget preaching about uh, the kingdom of God being an already, not yet kind of thing. And I'm still see that little red light on my camera. And I'm almost wrapping up. When a man stands up in, from the balcony of the church and says at the top of his voice, a man who is on the margin of the margins of our community, Sir! Sir, excuse me, sir, I have a question! <laughs> I'm here to tell you, it's incredible how many thoughts the human mind can process in a very short time. <laughs> Just a little, a little hit of the things that we, yeah, it's like up and up about there. The things, just a couple things. Thought number one, and I'll confess it, I'm not proud of it, was this. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? Thought number two was, uh, because I'm just wired this way, a little bit of sarcasm. It's like, well, of course, why wouldn't you have to this way? <laughs> Thought number three was, I need a strategy. I've got to do something. I'm just going to keep going, and eventually he'll stop. And, uh, I tried that for about two seconds, and it was very clear he was going to keep going. And it was up to me to make some kind of change. This is like completely out of my tradition, you know? Then the fourth thought, and this is where I'm going to be a little vulnerable with you. My fourth thought, I'm a little ashamed to say, was this. My ordination is in peril. I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what to say. I don't, I, I don't know what to do with this thing that I've worked so hard for for the last 10 years total from beginning to end. It's, it's in jeopardy. I have to fly from, down, from San Antonio to Dallas because that's where my conference membership was. I mean, I'm still paying off Southwest credit card debt for these flights, you know? And just totally <laughs> end it. Right? And then this is where the transformational moment occurred. And I have to attribute this purely to the Spirit of God. I couldn't have articulated it this way in that moment. This is what happened. I had this overwhelming, liberating sense of this is not about me. Come on, man. This is about what God is doing in this place. At this time. It's about God's word and the sanctity of this moment. And it's about this brother of mine in the sanctuary who has an honest to goodness question, but does not bound me enough to know when is a good time to ask it. It's a true story. <laughs> and so I realized I had a choice to make at that moment. Because though it's not unheard of in this community for that to happen, it's rare. Division was occurring in the body. And I had a 
choice. I can either perpetuate the division and keep more indignity on this man, or recognize the sacredness of this moment and the sacredness of this body and the sacredness of that man and treat him with dignity and respect because he is an image carrier of God. And again, Soli Deo Gloria, thanks be to God, the very gave me just enough strength to choose the latter. And we had a very brief conversation. I was like, I'd love to talk more with you about this a little later. And uh, maybe we could meet down by the stairs afterwards. And it was great. The community was affirmed. We held together. He was treated with respect. And I had all kinds of things to talk about at my board board day ministry. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so debriefing this moment uh, with some mentors and a covenant group, I have to tell you, and I'm still in the process of forgiving myself, I still feel a bit ashamed that those first four thoughts or so, the ones that I'm sharing, uh, there were some other thoughts that are not appropriate for any audience. Uh, <laughs> they were all fear driven. Because fear can be a powerful thing. Fear can cause division. Fear can enslave us. You know, there's something in the human condition that I honestly believe each one of us are capable of, of, of are capable of having the, the tendency to compartmentalize and label things so we can marginalize them and not have to be real about them. There's, there's something about the way we've lived in Greek dualistic thinking for all these years, a lot of us have told these little out to you, that things are either Jew or Greek. Maybe that's not it at all. And in my worst moments, and I'll confess this to you, I, I've had those, those thoughts of, I need to unravel this rich tapestry that God is weaving, all these beautiful things, and use those threads to create a homogenous banner of us. Fear is the lingua franca of our day. Some politicians seek to divide us by fear. Some members of the media seek to divide us with fear. Some religious leaders of all stripes, instead of using the things we have in common like compassion and grace, seek to separate us with fear. This proclivity for division is prevalent in our time. And as we heard in this scripture reading, it must have been prevalent in Paul's time as well. But God has given us an incredible commandment about this. You know what the number one imperative in the Bible is? Anybody? You can say it out loud. Fear not. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Every time something divine encounters something human in the Bible, we hear the same phrase repeated over and over again. Do not be afraid. Because fear-filled, small, insular creatures is not what God wants for us. God's dreams for us are so much bigger and more vibrant and more wonderful and more connected than all of that. Do not be afraid. Friends, God is calling us to love and to unity. Because there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Amen? Amen.